Uh, I, as Lacey said, I know many of you. I've presented here a few times in the past. And uh, one of our presenters, Tom Hansen, has been here many times in the past as well, presenting on, on world affairs and um, uh, things that are going on in the world. Uh, just very briefly, and I want to be very brief, um, uh, for about 10 years, I supported a, I ran a foundation in Minneapolis in support of a Norwegian NGO called the Oslo Center for Peace and Human Rights. Uh, during that time, I had a, there was a period of time when I had a, an executive leader fellowship at the University of Minnesota, uh, West Bank. Um, I was actually affiliated with the Humphrey School uh, Center for Integrative Leadership. And I had some brilliant uh, interns during that time, uh, many of them uh, working on several master's uh, or advanced degree disciplines in uh, the law school, international management, or, or um, the Humphrey School. And um, uh, one, uh, one student that I worked with was not an intern. He was actually a brilliant young uh, student, uh, uh, exchange student from Ukraine who was uh, going to Hastings High School. His name is Roman Polachuk, and you, Polachuk, and uh, you will meet him shortly. Uh, Tom Hansen, um, uh, who's going to be moderating this program, uh, began his career with uh, the Peace Corps, and uh, then spent many years with the U.S. State Department as a diplomat, uh, serving in many U.S. Uh, embassies in Europe, uh, both Europe and Eastern Europe. Um, he is currently the diplomat in residence at the Allworth Institute at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Uh, Roman Polachek uh, went back to Ukraine, uh, got his degree at the Lviv University, and during that time in 2014, I organized a forum similar to this in Oslo, Norway. Uh, the first time, not the first time, but when uh, Russia invaded uh, Crimea. And um, we brought uh, Roman over from Ukraine to be the keynote speaker when he was just 19 years old uh, at, the, at this forum. Uh, Tom Hansen uh, also participated in that forum. Uh, he has since uh, graduated from the university and has started several uh, high-tech uh, startup companies in Ukraine. Um, his um, uh, beautiful young uh, fiance, Yuliana uh, Pavlik, uh, is a certified uh, psychologist. She just got her degree, and she's in the process of becoming certified as, as, a, um, uh, as a, a psychoanalyst uh, uh, with her own practice in uh, Lviv, Ukraine. Uh, with that uh, short introduction, uh, I'm going to turn this directly over to uh, Tom Hansen, who is going to give a, just a brief overview of the current situation uh, in Ukraine, and then he will segue over to Roman and Juliana uh, with uh, specific questions. Uh, we're going to make sure that there's plenty of time for you, the audience, to also ask questions directly to uh, both Tom and uh, Roman and uh, Juliana. And uh, remember that uh, Roman and Juliana uh, are live in Ukraine and uh, it's about seven o'clock in the evening, their time. Uh, but um, I wanted to say also that I'm billing this as uh, unfiltered news. Much of our local or much of our uh, media these days is filtered through uh, major media or fringe media. Uh, this is the real story of what's happening in the Ukraine uh, directly from two, uh, two people who are, are, are directly involved in it. So with that, uh, Tom, I want you to take it away. Well, thanks very much, Orlin. And uh, first of all, it's wonderful to see you all again there in Ely. I wish we were in person. Um, and it's wonderful to see you, Juliana and Roman. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to take just a few minutes before we uh, get the, the real view of what's happening from Juliana and Roman, uh, just to kind of frame the issue of Ukraine. Um, I'm going to use just a few slides here. Uh, here we go. I hope, yep, there we go. Hope everyone can see that. Um, Ukraine is a fascinating and very important country. It is the second largest country in Europe, second only to Russia. It has a population of 45 million. Um, oops, wait a second here. Here we go. Um, the capital, Kiev, is a major uh, European capital of much history. Uh, this is the Maidan, where uh, the important events of 2014 took place, uh, a symbol of the resistance um, and patriotism of the, of the Ukrainian people. 
it is, as we all know now from this crisis, a, a real breadbasket of Europe. Uh, you can see how important Ukraine is in, in global uh, um, uh, agriculture. Between them, Ukraine and Russia account for 30% of all uh, food exports in the world. And that's just why this, this promising, important country is going through such trauma now with uh, this barbaric uh, Russian invasion that has, uh, has got the whole world now um, concerned about the future of this region. How did this all unfold? Well, of course, it began with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. It collapsed into 15 republics. Um, ironically, Russia and Ukraine at that time were instrumental in promoting the breakup. Boris Yeltsin was in favor, so they, Russia Ukraine cooperated very closely uh, in 1991. But already by 1994, you could see some potential problems. In 1994, the Bucharest Memorandum was signed. Um, Ukraine had former Soviet uh, nuclear weapons on its territory, and the United States very much wanted to remove nuclear weapons uh, from the former republics, and so Ukraine agreed. Uh, it was a nuclear power at that time. You uh, agreed to this. Here you can see Boris Yeltsin, um, uh, Bill Clinton, Leonid Kuchma, and John Major signing this agreement, which gave Ukraine assurances of its security if it would give up its weapons. Now, the United States was insisting on the word guarantees, and the Russians refused to accept the word guarantees. They said assurances, which is less, a uh, less strong term. You could see already then uh, the ambivalence that was developing in the Russian position. Uh, of course, in the ensuing years, uh, uh, NATO and the European Union uh, began receiving members who wanted to join. Um, and uh, this expansion included the Baltic states, former republics, and began moving closer to countries like uh, Ukraine and Georgia. Now, in 2008, uh, a crisis broke out in Georgia, and Russia did what they've done now in Ukraine. They occupied two key areas of Georgia and declared at that time that they had a sphere of influence uh, in their immediate uh, region. Now, the West, the United States, always has opposed that concept that there should be a sphere of influence. A country like Ukraine should be free to choose its affiliations. Um, and this is a very strong principle uh, for the West, for NATO, and for the European Union. And it's at the heart of the conflict. Uh, the crisis worsened in 2014 when uh, Ukraine there in green and Georgia were caught between two huge economic uh, entities, the European Union and the Eurasian Customs Union. Um, uh, basically, Putin was, was insisting that, uh, that Ukraine join his union. Uh, the whole thing exploded into a crisis which led to, as we know, the occupation of Crimea and the beginning of the Donbass conflict. Now, Putin, uh, very ominously, about a year ago, started making speeches saying that Ukraine is not a country and has never been a country. Uh, these were already warning signs that something bad was coming. He gave several long interviews, wrote articles about this. Now, in response, the West, uh, although not letting Ukraine into uh, NATO yet, has been increasing its military support. Actually, the Trump administration gave uh, military weapons to Ukraine that the, the Obama administration uh, refused to do. Uh, and, and in September this year, uh, Ukraine and the United States signed a Charter of Security Cooperation uh, in which it, the United States made it clear that, that Ukraine would be, get, be brought into the Western transatlantic institutions and the door is still open to NATO. Um, the Russians started mobilizing five days after this, this agreement in which the United States had so clearly uh, stated its ongoing support. Um, the Russians underestimated uh, the resolve of the Ukrainians, they underestimated how European Ukraine had become in 2017. In May, the EU allowed visa-free travel from Ukraine into the entire Schengen area of the European Union. Th this and other steps really reinforced a kind of a European identity, a European feeling um, in Ukraine. The Russians really underestimated how much Ukraine had changed. Um, because for Putin, he has a, an imaginary concept of something called Nova Russia, which is here at the eastern part of Ukraine, which he says is historically uh, part of Russia, going back to Catherine the Great. 
uh, here you can see the uh, regions that are under conflict. Um, he, he uses as his justification the fact that a, a lot of Eastern Ukraine has Russian as, a, as their first tongue as opposed to Ukrainian. Um, and of course, uh, a lot of the key agricultural and especially industrial areas are all in the East. So this is the prize that uh, after having tried to take Kiev, the Russians now are focused on this, on this region. And you can see here's uh, as of two days ago where the fighting is going on um, uh, with Ukraine maybe uh, starting a counteroffensive toward Kherson. Um, but the danger is that Russia will try to hold referendums uh, in these areas uh, starting already in September. So we're at a very important moment um, in the conflict. Now, the West is supporting Ukraine, yes, but uh, not actually getting involved apart from targeting. We, we are helping them to, to target their missiles, but we're providing them HIMARS of very accurate uh, missiles which are re wrecking havoc behind the lines uh, for the Russian troops. And just yesterday we announced we'll be giving them HARMS uh, uh, missiles which are anti-radar. This can knock out uh, Russian radar and can open the skies to Ukrainian uh, military jets. So this could be an important uh, step. The United States uh, is now giving another 1 billion uh, of military aid. 50 other countries are also aiding Ukraine. Um, uh, and so uh, our total has been $9.8 billion worth of aid to Ukraine because the West stands behind Ukraine in this conflict. A final point, it's been a human tragedy unfolding uh, on the ground in Ukraine. One third of Ukrainians have been forced from their homes. Uh, over 10 million Ukrainians have crossed the border, leaving Ukraine. 6.2 million are internally displaced. Um, and uh, some are returning. In fact, I'm interested to ask Roman and Yulianna uh, whether they see signs of people coming back. But uh, all around the world, uh, people are receiving uh, Ukrainian refugees. In Minnesota, there are about 900 uh, Ukrainians who have applied uh, for refugee status here. 300 so far have been given humanitarian um, parole, uh, uh, which is a two-year program where they can stay that long. So the world is standing up for Ukraine. Um, it's a tragic situation, uh, a barbarian invasion. Um, and uh, I, I look forward now, and we all look forward to hearing uh, from Yuliana and Roman um, how things are looking now on the ground, how things are in their daily lives in the midst of this crisis. So, um, Roman, Yuliana, if you would just like to say a few words at the beginning before we do a few questions, and welcome, welcome. Uh, thank you, Tom, uh, for such a great intro. Uh, thank you, Orlan, for your introduction. Really appreciate that. Uh, indeed, we have known each other for a while, and uh, it's a great pleasure to have an opportunity to speak uh, to such a wonderful group today. Um, I don't know what much to add on top of what Tom has already shared. You know, it's either very short or a very long story. Uh, so it's kind of hard to, to, to add more information on top because it's just going to be an addition to that. Uh, what I want to say is that, um, you know, it's, it's basically one thing uh, that right now we are fighting for our independence uh, and we're going to win this war. Uh, and this is basically it. Uh, the end of the story and this is what's going to happen. Uh, so this is uh, sort of an outlook into the future, um, you know, and maybe Juliana has, has more to add on top of that. It's my pleasure to be here and um, it's, it's hard to describe what it's like. Sometimes it feels like you live in two different realities and both are happening at the same time. So maybe I will share a little bit more uh, when you ask some questions. So. Okay, very good. Um, I'll, I'll just now ask a few questions here before we open up to the, uh, to the whole audience. Um, I, I have one question, and that is, you know, there's a reports that the maybe up to four million uh, have, uh, Ukrainians have come back across the border. Now, are you seeing that where you are in Lviv? Do you think, do you see that there's actually some a sign of Ukrainians coming back and wanting to be in Ukraine and part of what's going on? Uh, do you see that there in Lviv? Yes, definitely. And um, I remember our presidents once said that Ukrainians are are a little different 
because they never wanted to leave their homes. And Ukrainians are very dependent on their homes. And that's, that's how it was for our grandparents, for our ancestors. Like we take care of our homes and home is a very important place for us. So living your home is a very difficult decision. And that's why so many Ukrainians are not leaving uh, the places that are being constantly shelled because it's too difficult, too heartbreaking to leave a place where they were born and raised. But a lot of, and that's why a lot of Ukrainians are coming back. They are coming back as soon as they have an opportunity because they want to be home. And that's the story of my family, my, uh, my family, my parents, my grandmother. I have three sisters. Left when the war started because my sisters are small, but they came back because it is, it is emotionally and psychologically unbearable for them to stay at home. Yeah, and just, uh, to add a little bit on top of that, um, you know, at the beginning, of course, people been mainly leaving, uh, you know, because it was scary. Nobody knew what was going on. Um, mostly people with women with kids, right? Because men cannot leave at all uh, by the law, uh, unless there are some circumstances that allow them to. Uh, but otherwise, women with children would leave and, and go abroad because it was not safe here. And uh, it is still not safe here. Um, and uh, But at the beginning, you really didn't know where it's going to go. Uh, you know, we thought that we are going to have Russian soldiers on the streets here, and we've been ready to fight. Um, you know, so that was the situation, but as, as things started to clear out, especially after Russians leaving the north of Ukraine and yeah. uh, leaving Kiev region, uh, people realized that uh, they can come back and uh, the government advised them not to. Uh, the government was telling that it's still very dangerous, uh, but, uh, you know, people didn't really care and decided to come back because, as Juliana said, um, it's it's very important to them. And uh, there was even a joke, um, you know, during this war that before the war, people would want to leave for a better life uh, and, and they wanted to go. But as soon as war started, uh, they wish they never had to leave, you know, uh, and that's that's the essence of all of that. Um, and that's how Ukrainians feel about Ukraine uh, right now. Uh, and that's why they are coming. Uh, a lot of people are coming back. A lot of people are still leaving. Um, we are getting the reports from the region and the borders that we currently have with Poland. Uh, approximately as many people as are leaving are coming into Ukraine daily. Uh, so this is the statistics that we see. It changes. Sometimes more people leave. Sometimes more people come back. But we are seeing that more and more people uh, decide to come back to Ukraine. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, what's it like there in Lviv? I know there have been some rocket attacks in Western, in Western Ukraine. Um, um, how, how disrupted are your lives by the potential of those attacks? And ha have there been cyber attacks? You know, everyone has expected that the Russians might launch some kind of cyber attacks to disrupt daily life in Ukraine. Have you seen or sensed any of that? It's hard to say. We had some like we had some difficulties with, with electricity sometimes but rarely when it would just go off but then it, they would turn it back on so i don't know if that was a cyber attack or it just happened mm -hmm. but other than that uh, in, in terms of cyber attack maybe you will say more about rockets and stuff but in terms of cyber attacks uh, there have been massive attacks everywhere like that's not a secret right uh, but the problem or not the, the problem for Russians is that Ukraine has one of the strongest IT communities in Eastern Europe. We have a very strong school of IT here in Ukraine and businesses kicked in to help the government to, to protect the digital assets and digital security of the country. Not talking about that we have a ministry of digital transformation. We have our passport on our phone and we are not required to carry a physical passport. We have first country in the world. Uh, I can pay my taxes in five minutes. I can send my tax reports in 10 minutes and I just need to click a few buttons and that's it. That's oh, how so online, banking. online banking, I can transfer the money, I can receive the money, I can pay my bills, all of that within a touch of a button on my phone. So we have to remember that Ukraine is digitally very far away and we've been prepared for that. We have the whole ministry that is working on that, of course. 
uh, we have the uh, regional ministries and stuff, uh, their websites hacked and, and things like that, but that was quickly fixed, uh, brought back to life. And uh, now, uh, just a few days ago, because Ukraine was very forward in open data and open government data in terms of procurement, in terms of all the transactions that are happening within the government, uh, right when the war began, uh, this public data was closed, um, and it, it includes the personal information of people, private entrepreneurs, stuff like that, so that the Russians cannot use that. Uh, but uh, just a week ago, they now opened the data again, so you can transparently see how the money are being spent, what is going on. Um, so in terms of that, we are fairly secure, I think, uh, and we have pretty good hackers too. Um, you know, there have been attacks on Russians as well, um, and they've been pretty funny. So we hope that continues. Uh, and, and not talking about that at the beginning of the war, the most massive action that was taken was actually the, the action of cyber attacking Russian government websites and stuff like that. I had a software on my computer that was attacking Russians physically. And thousands of people, if not millions of people had that. It, it was a whole movement. So, you know, we are, I, I think we are doing pretty well in that regard, uh, comparing to the rest. Uh, but in terms of the uh, rocket attacks, maybe Juliana will share a little bit more with you. Uh, Ukrainians have a great sense of humor. And I remember uh, just, when, uh, just when they invaded Ukraine and they started stealing like toilets and all the used stuff, and uh, they saw that uh, they could give people some money, like a couple of pennies or something, but they didn't know we had online banking and people could <laughs> money online. And that was just not a thing for them. So that was, that was pretty funny. But about the rockets, it's been almost six months. So it's very different now because our psyche adapts and we have to adapt. So, um, and we adapt in different ways. Uh, sometimes uh, there are people who don't go to, to the basement, who just sit outside, and there are people who take precautions. But it was definitely very scary in the beginning. Like, I prayed all the time. Um, it was very scary, and it felt like it could drop any minute right at your house, and you didn't know what to expect. It was scary again, scary like that, like those first days when um, there was more tension with Belarus and we didn't know if they would attack from the north. And so, it's very close to, to me, it's like uh, 200 kilometers away yeah, from us. So <laughs> then it felt like, like panic is scary again. But then, and that's why I said that it often feels like you are different, you know, like you are living in two different realities because in one reality, you understand there is war, there are like there are and you have to hide. And in the other reality, you don't know how long this is going to last. And you know, you have to keep living, you have to go to work, you have to take care of yourself. And um, that's, that's where it's hard because it's taking a lot of your energy and like you feel tired. Yeah, and tired. at the same time, um, if we, we all carry the responsibility to be productive, to be as effective as we can. If we are not fighting with our guns, you know, on the east, we should be doing something. And that's exactly the case uh, with what we have right now, this is what Juliana is describing. So a lot of time, uh, you know, you know that you should be working a lot, you need to be donating money to the military, you need to be donating money elsewhere, you need to be helping people, you need to be doing all that while you have a country at war, while you have thousands, tens of thousands of people that are dying, when you see funerals, when you see all of those people crying, you see all of that around, and you are, you know, on one hand, you have to be even better than before the war, you have to be more productive all while all of that is happening. And that's what creates the most pressure and stress. Um, you know, and Juliana will share more about the, the mental state of people and, and how it impacted that. But overall, it, it's been pretty tough. 
And uh, also we had a few rocket attacks launched on Lviv. And, and if, not a few, we had a lot, but a lot of those rockets were taken down, but we had a few that hit Lviv directly. One of them hit a, an oil storage unit um, that was around four kilometers away from our house. And we could hear the explosion. We could see the smoke coming out. Uh, we could see all of that. Um, and that happened once. And then after that, we had another one. Um, so we, we've heard the explosions around us, you know, and that's pretty scary. And as Juliana says, uh, you know, as it gets closer, you get less rational. You cannot act. Uh, you know, with the cold wind and thinking what you need to do, you just become very rational. The only thing that you think about is surviving. Uh, if we are talking about the rest of the Ukraine, especially the, the further you move in, uh, people are used to explosions there. Uh, people continue to die because Russians are randomly shelling the cities. If we are talking about the cities and if we are talking about using hoviters or something like that, it's completely random, it's not targeted. They're just shelling the cities, the residential areas, the supermarkets, the hospitals, uh, schools, uh, everything. Like there is nothing that they didn't shell, including the nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia a few days ago, uh, where we have a danger of nuclear, um, uh, how would you call it, nuclear disaster happening. So, uh, you know, there uh, people have been even, not even, but uh, under much more pressure and much more stress because of that. Uh, but a lot of time we see the reports, we see the videos and people, again, they just have to continue their lives, especially if we are talking about the elderly people that have no chance of leaving. And they all saying the same thing when, when they are being offered to be evacuated, because there are evacuations happening. They say one thing, who needs me now? Why, where am I going to go when I leave? You know, yes, there is part of the support. Yes, there is something, but here's my home. I know what to do there. And that's just the way it is. You know, speaking of the, what's happening further east there, uh, what are you hearing from, from the war zone uh, in the east? You know, a lot of, a lot of Ukrainians have fled because it's heavy fighting there now, places like Kherson. Um, on the one hand, there are reports of, of guerrilla warfare starting now, assassinations of Russian collaborators. On the other hand, um, there are a lot of Russian speakers over there. And so uh, is there much support? I mean, as a lot of the Ukrainians leave that area, is there kind of a hard core of Russian supporters left behind? Um, or how, how, what are you hearing from, this, from that zone? Yeah. That is a very good question. And just recently we've seen the, uh, the report from the uh, journalist that went into one of the cities that was right there and being constantly shelled. Uh, in, the east. in the east, yes, uh, it was Kramatorsk. Um, and uh, they spoke to the people. Uh, and uh, basically, what you're describing is true. So there is guerrilla war warfare, uh, and there are uh, people that are trying to to go and, and work with them uh, and, and uh, you know, stop all of this war from happening. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as you said correctly, a lot of people that left, uh, they, they wanted the, the, the safe life, they wanted to be part of Ukraine. And there are a lot of people that cannot leave right now. It, we also have to remember about that. Uh, and a lot of people that stayed, uh, let's say, maybe like 20% of all the people in the city state. Out of that 20%, there are a small minority of people that are, so to say, Russian supporters, but it has nothing to do with language. Uh, since the war started, this whole language question was absolutely shut because everybody understood that it was just about making some sort of a havoc inside of Ukraine, creating those differences artificially because it's nothing more than that. Uh, most of our friends who speak like Russian speaking are now switching to Ukrainian or speaking Ukrainian. A lot of people are doing that as well. A lot of keep uh, speaking Russians, uh, Russian and there is no problem with that. Uh, so uh, yeah, on, on one hand, uh, you know, there is a guerrilla warfare and there is that. There is a small minority of people that are supporting Russia, uh, but that um, that is a very small group of people, uh, and uh, it's hard to say that there is really support for that. 
most of those people want for the war just to stop. Like that's that's what they want to happen. Uh, it, yeah. But you have to remember that uh, they invaded the East in 2014. So the people who, who are pro-Russian, are collaborators, they have stayed there for quite some time and they are doing this for the money. Hmm. And they are doing this for some petty money. So that's also if you, yeah. if you the collaborators that are there that are uh, trying to go into local governments, uh, so-called local governments and stuff like that. They they are all just getting paid for that, you know, and they are there because they can be something uh, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to do that and it's very unfortunate to see and hear uh, but it is the way it is you know we um we have about a half an hour left and i think uh orlan i'm going to turn it over to you now uh so we can have some questions uh from the group there in ely that half an hour went very quickly <laughs> great, great observations, guys. Really. Okay. Um, I wanted to mention one thing that I, the last time I spoke with Roman uh, a few days ago on Zoom, uh, he was actually down in a bunker uh, down in their basement, and there they could see the, uh, the the bed that they had down there. Otherwise, there was brick walls, and uh, and that was to get away from the group uh, in the area things in perspective. Uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, ask if any of you have a question that you'd like to um, ask uh, either Tom, Roman, or Juliana. I have a question on the export, uh, Ukrainian exports. Has that lane opened up or has most of the um, sea export businesses have they been shut down or shelled by the russians yeah you want to that's a very good question thanks a lot for asking that overall uh, since the war began uh, and as tom has pointed out very correctly uh the central part of ukraine and eastern part of ukraine where it's those are the regions where the most crops were produced and we are talking about crops right now um that was significantly impacted, especially because the port, the only active port that was ready to support that, which is in Odessa, uh, was shut down because of the constant shelling. They, they couldn't load anything on, on the boats. They couldn't do anything with that. Uh, and because marine transport was the main one, basically all of the transport uh, or export of grain uh, was halted completely. Uh, if we are talking about the railways, uh, there is now uh, so much um, so much stuff going through the railway. Uh, this is the main communication between uh, the West, uh, Central Ukraine and East. We are talking about the supply of weapons, all, all sorts of the support that is coming from the West. It's coming by trains because this is the most effective ways of doing that. And we have a very complex railway system. Uh, so the railway uh, tracks are occupied by that. And, you know, if we're talking about the expert uh, of, of grain, we need to a lot of that. And it's just impossible to, to provide it that way and move it through the borders either uh, by the road or by trains. Uh, so it was completely halted. And uh, about a few days ago, there was a first uh, tanker, or, or I, I don't know the name for it, that left Odessa uh, under the agreement, even though there was an agreement before and right after that Russians shelled uh, the port um, and uh, you know been provocating again. Uh, so now the first barge has left and I think that there is going to be more leaving. We hope for that, but it's very hard to predict because uh, if we are talking about Russians, the one thing, the one lesson uh, that I think everybody in the world needs to learn and we heard this so many times before is that no agreement that was signed with Russia on the paper is worth the paper it was signed on. So this is exactly what we are talking about. Uh, they've been absolutely going against any any rule of law, any any possible rules that were set up ever. So it's hard to predict. We hope that 
it will start happening more actively and with the support of HIMARS, with the support of guided missiles, with the support and the ability to protect our sky and protect our ports, yes, there's more ability to do that. Uh, but uh, if we're talking about Western support, there's also a problem with a long waiting time. Um, you know, uh, a lot of things we need today or yesterday, and they are arriving months after that. And because of that, everything is kind of going behind. Uh, but again, uh, thanks to the support from the West and our military and our government, now there is an ability to, to export the grains and we hope it will continue that way. I am wondering, uh, since you are um, coming directly from Ukraine over here, are you in any danger doing that? I'm sorry, could you please repeat? Because it was hard to, to hear. Sorry. Uh, since you are now directly from the Ukraine, are you in danger of doing these, these, these um, presentations? Well, answer. I think we are in danger because we are Ukrainians, but we are brave enough, so we are not scared. It's, you know, danger is, is very hard to measure. Um, if you ask anybody in the world, are they in danger? Well, potentially, yes. You know, we, we all in danger, uh, including being here in Ukraine. And, um, you know, the what, when things started to turn around, uh, because at the beginning, when Russians started to really push into Ukraine, Everybody left. Uh, all the American core left. Uh, all the European core and embassies left. Everybody left because everybody thought that it was going to end quickly. Uh, they're going to get to Kiev, then they're going to get to Western Ukraine, and that was it, right? So that was the plan, but it didn't go according to the plan. Um, somehow we managed to stand our ground, and somehow we are waging the war for half a year uh, with one of the strongest armies in the world. Uh, and believe me, as I said at the beginning, we are going to win this war. Uh, it's inevitable. Uh, and if we are talking about danger, uh, talking, uh, you know, we are not in danger. I, I don't think that there is anybody that's going to go after us. We are not so influential. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, and uh, there is very little of that shady activity going on the background. A lot of the people that have been agents have already been caught. Um, so our internal services are doing a very good job of that. Uh, if we are talking about rocket attacks, well, if we hear a air siren, then we'll go to the shelter and hopefully not get killed. So that's, that's how it looks like. I saw a question in the chat uh, that asked, do people continue to work their usual jobs? Should I answer? Uh, yes, so please go ahead and answer. I think it really depends because a lot of people lost their regular jobs. A lot of people were displaced and they don't have a job in a new city or in a new country. And uh, I think if a, if, if a person has a job, they really try to keep it because the prices are getting higher and people still have to, to buy stuff and provide for their families. So, um, if a person has a job and they're able to keep it, then they do their best um, to keep it. And all of the people we know, yes, they do go to their regular jobs. They work, they work even more than they did before war because it's a way to escape reality, to, to work hard, to get very tired and then to just fall asleep and hopefully wake up and it will be a dream. Yeah, and just uh, to add a little bit on top of that, um, it is important to remember that a lot of people do very dangerous work. Uh, that is very important, uh, especially if we are talking about rescue services, if we are talking about medics, if we are talking about the professions that are connected to work. A lot of those people are coming from, um, you know, very safe places and they are going to very dangerous places to save people, to rescue people, to bring them back. We have so many volunteers uh, that are, this is, if we're talking about volunteers, we should do a different, uh, uh, you know, conversation and talk about that specifically, because it's very unique to Ukraine. You have to understand that half of the support 
uh, of of all the military and what happened was going through volunteers. Uh, probably volunteers done more in military support to Ukraine than the US did. Uh, and we are talking through donations, through purchasing stuff and sending it, right? So uh, a lot of that was happening. And by the way, if any of you want to be part of it, let me know, I'll contact you with, with the best organizations that can help you, um, uh, you know, get your money in. Uh, but uh, a lot of people are in danger, but they keep doing their work. Uh, but if we're talking about us um, and, you know, for example, living in Lviv, uh, as Juliana says, people want to keep their jobs. Uh, people, most people live as in most of the world from paycheck to paycheck. So, you know, there is no other way. You just have to work. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're scared, you want to do it or not. People go to work and, uh, and keep doing what, what they do best. I have a question. Statement too. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for taking this opportunity to talk to all of us. This is very precious. My question is Do you feel that the United States is doing enough to support you? And how do you feel and your friends around you that are getting enough support from the United States? And how can we, as small town USA, help you out? Maybe Roman will have a different answer, but for me, it's hard to judge. Um, me personally, I'm grateful for any help uh, we are receiving, I am receiving for being able to speak today. And that is because we got enough help so far, without which it just wouldn't be possible. So of course it would be a miracle Yes, if we could get so much help that the war would be over and we could win this and live a peaceful life, but it is what it is and I'm grateful for what we have already received and for what we will be receiving. Yeah, uh, I, I would agree with Juliana on that, um, you know. Oh, one other big realization that came to most of the Ukrainians after the war started is that the only people and the only country we can rely on is ourselves, finally. Uh, because that was actually, um, you know, we've been always looking towards the West, uh, as Tom said, especially with European integration and everything and everything. But after the war started, everybody realized that nobody is going to help us but ourselves. Um, and all the support and what is happening right now, a lot of that is happening because there is a huge Ukrainian lobby all around the world. Uh, one of the best people that have been in business on the market have left Ukraine to advocate for Ukraine to get the support and get all of that happening. And there have been a tremendous work done in terms of communicating it to the Western world. And we've got a lot of the support and we continue to wage this war because we have the support. We have now HIMARS that are saving thousands of lives because they are preventing Russians from shelling uh, our troops, even though it still constantly happens because they have so much weapons that they can continue to wage this war for a long time. Uh, we don't have that, uh, but fortunately with all the support, uh, we are able to defend ourselves and at some points launch counteroffensive. Um, of course, uh, you know, if instead of receiving 15 HIMARS, we would re receive 150 HIMARS and we would receive much more rockets to that, uh, we could wage war much more effectively. And we are uh, even talking not about the numbers of, of the uh, HIMARS, but we are talking about the numbers of rockets because they are very expensive and Ukraine is very careful uh, with how we use them and where we use them. Uh, and those are shorter range uh, systems. Uh, we also would be very grateful if you know somebody in the government to provide us with the 300 kilometer range uh, systems. That would be absolutely amazing. Uh, we could send you some great videos and, and you know everything that goes with that. Uh, but overall, uh, you know there is a lot that's being done. Uh, there's always more that can be done, and we would be forever grateful for that. Um, and that's basically it. If we are talking, by the way, uh, part of the question was, what can you do locally? I think, and, and I uh, didn't quite answer that. So if I can take a moment. Uh, overall, uh, there is a lot of different uh, NGOs uh, that are working in Ukraine. There are very large NGOs that are very transparent about how they spend their money, what they do, 
where it's being sent. There are multiple ways that um, you know you can help personally or as a group. By the way, uh, I am a part of the Rotary uh, International. So if there are fellow Rotarians, there is an uh, opportunity to apply for um, emergency grants from Rotary. So if you're interested, Orlan will share my email and we can do that. So that's one of the ways because there is an ability to involve larger sums of money to do that. Um, and there's also uh, an opportunity to do anything, you know, starting from purchasing uh, um, destroyer drones, uh, ending with providing, you know, basic hygiene stuff to, to people in need that currently do not have access to it. So it's, it's a wide, ra wide range of things. And, uh, you know, if, if you want to discuss it more, let me know, we can do it. You talked about uh, a shelling on a nuclear. Um, you also talked about an attack on a storage facility. I was wondering what are the potential widespread effects of that attack on the nuclear power facility? You talked about that being very stressful. And also, do you think that these attacks are intentional, including the attacks on residential areas? Because there are random shellings, but these shells are specifically landing on. Uh, if you could please repeat, uh, because we cut parts of it, uh, but it would be very helpful. Maybe the first part about nuclear. nuclear. Okay. Can you move the microphone a little bit away from your mouth? Okay. So I was. Um, uh, you guys talked about attack on a nuclear uh, power plant and facility. I was curious about the potential effects of those attacks, especially on the nuclear power facility. I was also curious about: um, Do you think these attacks are intentional, um, and especially on the residential areas, because these are random shellings, but these shells are landing on residential areas? And I was wondering. Do you, why do you think the Russian military would be like shelled on residential areas? That's a good question. I, <laughs> I wish we would have answer to that, you know. Of course, it is intentional. Uh, it definitely is. Everything they do is intentional and it is with one intention so that we get scared and intimidated and we just give up but that just works in reverse for Ukrainians. The worse they treat us, the more resilient we become, and they don't seem to understand it yet. But the attacks in residential areas are um, definitely intentional, and the way they portray them in their news is that uh, we are doing those attacks on ourselves or, or something else. And this war, it's just about destroying Ukrainians. It's a genocide. The amount of people they have killed, they have brought 40,000 bags with themselves. And we thought at first that those bags were for their soldiers. But then we found out that they brought portable, uh, portable crematoriums. And then we found out about Mariupol and Bucha and all the mass graves that they were doing. What was the intention of that? That is just a genocide. And I think it's very different for us Ukrainians and for people abroad, uh, like in US or in Europe, is what is different is that for people abroad, it's just this one event. For most of the people, Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th, and that's it. But for Ukrainians, it's a hundred years history. That's what Russians have always done with Ukraine, like the famine that they created in 1933, with tens of millions of Ukrainians being starved to death. They took all the food away. And for us, when the war started, all of those stories we heard from our grandmothers, from our great grandmothers, from our parents, all those stories came to life. It was like all the stories that they told us when we were younger about the times, the hard times that they survived through. It's like they came to light and we saw them as in a movie and it's history repeating itself. And 
they need Ukraine because they want to steal our history. They want to steal the history of Kiev, Russ, of how we were founded because they have this imperialist um, desire that they are trying to fulfill for centuries. And that's why they try to kill us. So we don't exist and they do. So it's, it's obvious to us, to us here. And, um, and this is the feeling um, that I felt very strongly uh, when they invaded us in February. I felt that on my skin, that they are here to kill me specifically because I am Ukrainian. I speak Ukrainian, and if they would come to leave, me and Roman would be their target number one, because we studied in US, we are smart and intelligent and will our country, and we are ready to stay here no matter what. So the people who have already died from, who were raped, who were murdered, who were tortured, they're the same people that I am the same people that Roman is, they are no different. They are just Ukrainians and they just don't want us to exist. So that's their intention. And uh, they, are, they are shelling the nuclear plants for the same reason. That's their way to manipulate, to manipulate West, to scare, to have some, some sort of control because they do not really have much control in the fields with our soldiers. So they attack us from air where we have little control. So that's just. Yeah, and um, potential dangers. Uh, well, if you remember Chernobyl, easy. Easily the same, maybe much worse. That's basically the answer to that. I so, believe Zaporizhia is bigger than Chernobyl. Yeah, and in Chernobyl there was one reactor that was destroyed. In Zaporizhia there are four active reactors. One of them was stopped currently because the uh, supply of oxygen and something else was stopped because of the shelling. So they had to stop the whole reactor. Three reactors are still active because they supply electricity to Ukrainians. And so that's what we have, you know, and uh, this is, the reality is, is when you open the news and you read the article on how to protect yourself from nuclear disaster, that you need to be inside, that you need to wash yourself, what do you need to do, how, how do you need to behave, this is the reality of the news in Ukraine, like this is the news that you read. And you actually read them. <laughs> yeah. You're Cause, like, cause you okay, I might read this, yes. That's, and that's, that's the scariest part of it, you know, that after what happened, you, you understand that there's nothing that they cannot do because they already done everything. Uh, and Juliana mentioned very well the world, the word genocide. It is a genocide. A lot of the European countries have already concluded that it's a genocide. So it's, it's not that we are just thinking of that. It is a genocide. They are intentionally destroying Ukraine and killing Ukrainians to erase the whole Ukraine from the map and, and let it be forgotten. That's that's the goal. They are not here to protect Ukrainians. I I know it's traumatizing and I don't know if you have seen the pictures, but like the pictures and the stories of mass shootings in the basements and just mass killings of men, Russian speaking men, Ukrainian speaking men. It doesn't matter. They were just shooting and killing people because they were Ukrainians and they did it for fun. So that that is why it's a genocide. Yeah. They have already killed tens of thousands of people. If and they, if they know, know you support Ukraine, that's it. Yeah. You are a goner. Uh, if we are talking about Eastern Ukraine occupied regions, all the people go through filtration camps. There are literally filtration camps where they will strip you down. They'll look for tattoos. They'll ask whether you support Ukraine. They'll ask whether you have any relatives in the army. They, they'll ask everything. And if there are wrong answers, that's it. You'll go into their jail and probably be tortured there. That's, that's the reality. My question is about the, uh, the daily uh, exposure you get in your lives uh, to propaganda 
uh, what, what kind of propaganda do you have to listen to? What form does it come in? And how do you deal with it? Well, the one I read today was that uh, a, like a Russian woman from the East was hanged in Lviv <laughs> in the city where me and Roman live. And she was hanging here for four days and people were like just walking around looking. And that's that if, just if that we're time, talking about yeah. Russian propaganda. Of course, yeah. Ukraine now has its own propaganda. And we have to remember that the country at war needs to have a total, you know, not total, but as much of support from its people as possible. And of course, Ukraine has its own propaganda talking about, you know, what we are doing and how we are doing it, etc. But the the main issue with it that it's hard to call it propaganda because we have friends all around Ukraine, we have friends that are in the military, we know those people personally. And, uh, you know, the, the line of the government media and what's happening right now aligns with that, maybe not perfectly, of course, uh, you know, war uh, is, is something that is very hard to put into any frame and justify it in any way. Um, you know, it's something that that is always bad, no matter what. But for Ukrainians, if we are talking about that, and again, Yuliana has mentioned that very well, um, we, we've been through that as a nation so many times. And I think since... Uh, it's our generational trauma. Yeah, uh, but since, since the full-scale invasion began, um, many Ukrainians realized, including myself, I, I was never violent. I was always against the conflicts. I was always against that. But when the war began, and when we started to see uh, those, you know, mass killings, uh, decapitation of people, I mean, anything, anything you can think of, it was already done, right? Uh, I realized, and a lot of people realized that the only way to end all of this, this hundreds of years of history, because it was happening, through the, the history. And again, we can dive into that, but it's going to take a long time. Uh, most of the Ukrainians realize that now we are the generation that has to finally put the end to it. That's, that's the thought. Excuse me. Uh, it's just a couple minutes before one o'clock. We have one more question back here. And, uh, and then maybe a final statement from both of you and, uh, and perhaps Tom. I love the term of war of independence because um, we can identify with that. The British invaded the colonies. And I worry that Americans will lose interest as, it, as time goes on. Our interest subsides and we start thinking about Trump and the next election and whatever. Uh, and I'm horrified at, 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 at the Russian activities. My question is, you said that victory is inevitable. Um, can you talk about that within a realistic framework? What, what I fear is that they just sit, sit at a distance, lob long distance shells into civilian areas, wipe out a city, the city's done, so we might as well give up on that one, and then they start on the next one, and that just keeps going on and on until the as you say, it's a genocide. They've killed all the Ukrainians and there's nothing left. But can you give me a basis for your optimism, which I admire greatly? Thank you for this amazing question. Um, of course, there, the help from the West can always stop, right? And this is what I said at the beginning that we realized that the only country and people we can rely on is ourselves. Uh, number two, um, we've gone too far to give up. We have lost too much to say, you know what, that's enough. Um, there are so many people that um, have everything uh, and now they are serving in the military because they want for all of this to end and they want to end it as soon as possible. The official line of the government from at the beginning of the war was somehow WAG 
what we're going to do and what's going to happen. Uh, more recently, the official line of the government was one and only, and it's fully supported. It has, uh, according to the polls, around 85% of support of Ukrainians. And that is, we need to get all of our land back, including Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. Um, we are a large country, uh, and that one thing that everyone has to remember, uh, we have around 1 million people serving in military right now today we have around few million more people that if necessary are ready to jump on this train as well uh, we have support not only from united states but we have support from other european countries and a big part of why they support our, us uh, is because if it's not us it's going to be them Everybody understands that the rule of international law is gone, and it's gone a while ago. The United Nations and everything that has to do with that is absolutely not effective. And uh, to be honest, haven't been for a while. Uh, and every country that is surrounding Ukraine and is close to Russia realizes that um, they have not much to rely on. Um, you know, I like to say, um, there are NATO countries and everybody says, well, NATO has an article, but we have an article. We have international agreements, we have international law, we have United Nations, we have all, all the laws that you can imagine in the world and nothing stopped from Russia invading and nobody interfering into that, right? So nobody is really protected. And that's what most of the, especially Eastern European countries understanding very well right now. They understand that no matter what kind of documents they have signed, what kind of blocks they are part of, um, you know, somebody can uh, or Russia can start invading the uh, member of uh, NATO, right? Start a full scale war. What prevents the NATO from saying, you know what? We don't want nuclear disaster. We don't want nuclear war. Why don't we just withdraw? Because it's a danger to the whole world. Exactly what happened to Ukraine. Right? Because the whole fear was that there's going to be nuclear war. That's why uh, there was no allowance of uh, a long range weapons. That's why we didn't have the protection of our sky, which we asked for. And because of that, probably hundreds of thousands of people have died. Uh, so overall, you know, um, there is very little optimism in all of that because we are all already have that inside, you know? if you talk to anybody in here. Um, so for us, there, there is no other way. That's the only way and, and everybody is going to do what they can, everybody. And that this, um, this is also the attitude of, well, I cannot say about all Ukrainians because right. I do not know all, but of the circle of people we talk with, everybody is very tired and everybody would be happy if we won this war tomorrow. But regardless of that, we are ready to, to do whatever we have to do and fight as long as we have to. And that's the attitude we have, no matter how tired we are. And that what gives us the sense of unity, that we are all in this together and we, we are tired together, but we are fighting together too. And just to add one more word on top of that, um... A lot of people are talking about freezing the conflict, as it happened in 2014, uh, as it happened with Crimea, uh, as it happened with Chechnya. If you remember, they had actually two wars. Uh, and you remember how the second war with Chechnya ended. So Ukraine very clearly understand that freezing this, and believe me, US, Europe, everybody would love for this conflict to just freeze and let the grain flow and let the work get back to pandemic and the recession and, and everything else that goes with that, right? Because it's still going on and, and we have to remember about this. Uh, but at the same time, Ukraine is not going to freeze this conflict for pure reason is if we freeze it, we'll have one year. And after that, Russia will gather even more troops, even more supplies, and they will erase Ukraine completely. Right now, they are having a hard time doing that right now we are effectively very effectively fighting back and that's why it's not going to stop and that's why our government 
and our people don't want this because everybody understands that if, that if it doesn't stop, you know, when it has to stop, it's going to get back. That's it. it, it's, it this conflict cannot be frozen. And because of that, the only way for us is to win. Um, well, if not win, then we'll all die. I also think it's very important to understand that for Ukrainians, this war is about values the values we are fighting for. And in Ukraine, we have this, um, we have this proverb that freedom is better than slavery and that there are some things that are worth dying for. And it's not a saying for us, that's a way of living. And values are very important for us, our homes, our families, our countries, a lot of our parents, grandparents, ancestors died fighting for freedom so we could speak Ukrainian language so that we could be free people. And uh, that what gives us strength, even when we are tired, is because we know we are fighting for our truth and we can stand confidently in it. And we know what we are fighting for. We are fighting so that our children have a safe future, so that my sisters have a future here or Roman's friends and family and like we have something to fight for and that's why we will not give up and that's that's why we believe that we will win because we will not give up and 10 more seconds uh, when if you can imagine you know waking up at seven in the morning and hearing uh, that um, I don't know, one of the states of uh, United States is being shelled and attacked by a foreign country. There are rockets flying around, people dying. Um, and all of that is just starts to happen, right? That seems impossible. It completely seemed impossible to me. We've been meeting with quite a few friends right before the war started. And I was saying, it's not going to happen. We've been talking with Tom. I told him the same thing. It doesn't make any sense. Tom told me the same thing. It doesn't make any sense. It's not going to happen. Well, believe me, what? You wake up in the morning and it's happening. But there's one important note in here to make. A lot of people thought that Ukrainians are going to turn around and leave the country. Well, what happened instead, if you went to the local military units, there have been kilometers long lines of men waiting to get guns and go and fight. On some of the streets of the Kyiv, when there was a very big danger of Kyiv being invaded, because the, the troops just rolled in. What they started to do, they started to give up uh, weapons to people on the street. It was one occasion, they gave up a few hundreds of Kalashnikovs, and those people went and, and shoot the Russians. So for some people, it may be hard to comprehend how can you you know, fight for your land and, and do all of that because it's scary, because it's death and, and whatever goes with that. But when it came to me and Juliana, we thought of leaving. And then the next thing, you know, we thought we are not going to leave. We had buckets with uh, empty bottles uh, near our house. We were ready to make Molotov cocktails. I was ready to go and find a gun. We were ready to be there and, and do all we can until we die. And that's me. You know, I, I love going to international conferences speaking about peace. So um, there is this note, and that's why I think we are going to, to win, and that's why it's going to go that way. Because everybody has something to fight for. I am a psychotherapist. I am the most peaceful and reasonable person like there could be. But I have something to fight for. I have Roman and I have my sisters. And luckily I am 25 and I've thought about this. I already lived a little, I fell in love and like I had, I had a great life so far and I experienced a lot. And I want for them to live at least until 25. I want for them to fall in love, to find a career that they will enjoy. And I was ready to take a gun and do whatever I have to do so that those soldiers don't come any closer to them because that was unimaginable to be. And that's how it is for every Ukrainian. Every Ukrainian has something to fight for, even if it's their cat or their dog. 
all of you. It's a little past one o'clock now, and uh, I'd love to have the final word, but I would end up speaking an hour. Uh, Roman and, and uh, Juliana, you are absolutely terrific, as always. Every time I talk to you, I'm just uh, overwhelmed with uh, emotion and, uh, and, and pride for, for being able to know you uh, as well as I do. Uh, if, if you would, uh, I, in the past, you've sent me um, uh, contacts with uh, organizations that can help. And, and Roman, you mentioned Rotary, that you're, I know that you're involved with Rotary International and that uh, some ways of uh, contributing. If you send that to me, I will share, share that with this group. And, um, and uh, we just, uh, we wish you well. And uh, Tom, uh, do you want to have a very brief final word? Well, just, uh... You two are so inspirational and, uh, you know, put this so well into context. You know, I, I know that early in this war, a lot of young Russians were protesting. Um, one hope I have is that there's a generational change that may happen in Russia. A, lo a lot of young Russians have left uh, because of the war. Uh, you know, Putin and his, his people are the last generation that was trained in the old Soviet Union. Uh, this is a kind of a last gasp of a generation, hopefully. I mean, that, that's the one hope I have in addition to the resolve that Ukraine has and all that you're going through for this long-term struggle. I just dream and hope that something might even happen in Russia because the greatest threat to Putin uh, is that Ukraine would be a, a flourishing democracy of human rights. It, this would be a model right on their border. Um, and so anyway, uh, I, I believe in your resolve and I believe in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Warland. Thank you, everyone in the group there. Uh, it was a pleasure for us.